So uh, let me just preface by saying this. I was getting ready to just make a video on Ephesians 1 and 2. Um, and there's enough in there, believe me. Ephesians is not the milk of the word. It starts out with the milk of the word in chapter 1, but it gets pretty heavy. Um, so when Paul is talking to the Ephesians through this letter, he's going to talk about how they were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And so there's a couple of um, posts here by some of our favorite folks here, you know, the anti-Calvinist group. If anyone is hearing this video for the first time, I'm not a Calvinist. The only way to describe what I believe is called sovereign grace. I don't believe that God's grace is corporate. I think it's very personal. Uh, I don't think Jesus died for just anyone. I don't think he died for a faceless mass of people. Uh, I mean, if he died for every single person, yeah, sure, he would see their face. But how is it that he's saying, depart from me for I never knew you? Okay, that's a huge problem. Those he foreknew, he also called. Okay, if he never knew you, then how could he have ever called you? See, what these people try to tell you is that that call is universal and it went out to the entire world. There is a huge problem with that, okay? And, and please understand, these videos are based on biblical truth, nothing else. I'm not here to scratch ears, tickle emotions, grow a 10,000 sub channel. If that ever would have happened, it would be by God's building, not my own. Um, what I teach is, is hated by most people. And I'm not trying to say, hey, look at my persecutions. No, but what I'm saying is the truth of the matter is it, it is hated by most people, okay? They don't like this idea. And and the video that I'm gonna make now is actually gonna prove unequivocally that you are quickened before you believe the gospel. It's very simple. This the verbiage there that I used to, to already tell you if you're kind of already looking into this. Um, but if, if they have to submit to the fact that you are quickened before you believe the gospel, then they have to submit the to the fact that you've been chosen by God, even though the, We've made, how many videos, guys, have we made? To my normal listeners, you've seen them all. How many times does God choose, right? Over and over, like crimson and clover. So I'm not going to get into God's choosing. This video is strictly about Ephesians 1, how people believe that you, this, the work of the Spirit only happens to you after you believe. See, even they have to deny that because they claim that the Holy Spirit works on everyone and people make the executive decision to either reject the gospel or accept the gospel. No, the seed was promised to Abraham. That's a specific people that God foreknew before the foundation of the world. That is the promised seed, the father of many nations, whether it be by uh, national Israel, ones who get saved through the remnant, you know, according to the election of grace. Uh, or Gentile believers after Christ was lifted up and he drew all men from all tribes, tongues, and nations to himself. Okay, so we know that those people were foreknown by God. Okay, God's foreknowledge is not a giant telescope or a crystal ball that he watches like a voyeur and peers down the corridors of his creation and sees people doing things and then reacts accordingly. No, he does according to his will among the inhabitants of the earth and the hosts of heavens. Hosts of the heavens. I said that backwards. It's among the hosts of heaven and the inhabitants of the earth. He does according to his will, right? So if we believe that he does according to his will, and we believe that he declared the end from the beginning, well, that means he actualized all those events. He knew who would believe and he knew wouldn't, of course, because he actualized those events. He was creating goats and he was creating sheep before the foundation of the world. And what we see is very simple. If you believe that the Holy Spirit comes to do a work on every single believer, then really what you're saying is the ability of the Father to draw people to Christ is just very, very ineffective, extremely ineffective, because you have most of the people, the unbelieving world, just don't even care. I mean, they don't even care. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because they neither know him or have seen him. Well, how do we see and understand? God's grace. So if God's grace is given to every single person, they should see and understand. I say to each and every one of you, by the grace given to me, Paul says, I say to each and every one of you not to think highly of yourselves. Why is he saying by the grace given to me? He even said that he was called from his mother's womb by God's grace. 
Guys, grace is not an impersonal blanket thing. It's extremely intimate, personal. It's God's love for his sheep. That's what that is. Okay, so imagine you, you, you have this heresy that the grace is just a corporate thing and it really is just delivered to everyone. And it's whoever makes that executive decision, I'm going to make the ethical choice today. I have weighed the pros and cons of believing and not believing. And I decide faith. I am going to self-generate faith. I'm going to muster it up. Does anybody have an experience like that? I would really like to know from y'all. Does anyone have an experience where you felt the conviction of sin and that was something that you could have decided to just push it away and ignore it? Or was it something that constantly festered in you until you saw the truth of the gospel, that Jesus Christ is alive? Okay. I didn't decide that Jesus Christ was alive. I'm just going to let you know that right now. I didn't, that wasn't a decision or a choice of mine whatsoever. What does 1 John 5, 1 say? Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. The fact that you believe Jesus is the Christ is 100% the work of God. If he's doing that work on everyone, then he has to finish it. Because he who began a good work on you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You either believe these scriptures or you don't. And so my message today is to try to implore to people that I am simply wanting you to see that we are not out here striving to cause division. That, that's what sometimes we'll get posts like that. You should do videos on other stuff. No, I am completely ensconced in this. I, I, I'm being revealed more truth every day. That is absolutely mind blowing to me. And I am going to share it with you. And the people that reject it, I understand. I don't hate you. I'm not going to call you unsaved. Please continue to believe in your free will, and you're more than welcome to come to our Discord. You will be given equal time to talk, and you will not be talked over. If you come with a genuine, you know, uh, urging to discuss these things and reason with us, if we could see that you're trolling us, you know, obviously, if it's just a troll and you're looking to you know, just make fun of our beliefs and stuff and call us wolves. And yeah, you'll be kicked out of there. If you're looking for a genuine dialogue is what I was looking for before. A genuine dialogue on these things, then you'll definitely be more than welcome. Come with your free will theology, present it, present your case. We'll go to the scriptures. We'll line it up with the word of God and we'll see how it stands the test. So uh, I'm just going to pull a few sayings out of here. This is not one of these videos where, oh, look at Greg Jackson and his heresy. That's Greg Jackson's already done that to himself, as far as I'm concerned. By you could, if you want to view my video, it says uh, it's it's titled um, "David B says Greg Jackson has an accursed gospel." In that video, you will see that Greg Jackson has a post on his wall. It's still up there, probably. I'm pretty sure. Uh, saying that believing the gospel or, or people have free will volition, God gave them that, and that through those abilities, free will, volition, decision-making, you can do moral and ethical things. You can make moral and ethical decisions. Then he puts in parentheses, including believing the gospel. So when you believe in free will, you have reduced something that is the power of God unto salvation to a moral ethical decision that you make like maybe you should donate to um nafta or you should you should donate to um saint jude you know moral ethical let me help kids that are suffering with cancer you could see th th without christ that work is nothing right people donate to those funds all the time but christ said apart from me ye can do nothing what does that mean you can literally do nothing for god unless you're in christ so moral ethical decisions from the surface here on earth, men looking at other men, and we see them helping one another, we see the good in that. But God only sees the good in you when you're in his son, because everybody else is a child of disobedience, walk, walking according to the prince of the power of this air. They're unbelievers. And you may see them as decent. I mean, imagine somebody helped you out and they're an unbeliever. You would feel, hey, what a good thing that person did for me. I would think the same. But when I look at things in a biblical context and the exhaustive mind of God and his word, I see that those works are filthy rags. 
I mean, it says all of our righteousness is filthy rags, all of it. So that's a, a general worldly declaration to all people. <laughs> Your works are as filthy rags. So I accept that truth, but I can still feel a certain type of way about someone who helps me who doesn't believe God is God. I'm still going to say, hey, thank you. You know, and maybe you get a chance to give them the gospel. Ask them if they believe that Jesus died for their sins. There's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. If they say no, tell them who Jesus was. Jesus died and he rose again. And whoever believes in him will be saved. That's the truth. You can say that to a total stranger. You know, and they're either going to be given increase by God or not. After that, it's out of your hands. Here's my card. Here's my number. If you want have any questions, feel free to ask me. I will tell you everything I know about Jesus Christ. Um, and they'll say, well, what, you're, what are you going to say? You're going to say he predestined some of them to hell? Well, that's how we walk. We walk in a fallen world. God was just in not saving any one of us. He destroyed the world in a flood. Okay, he's capable of doing that. He is just in destroying every person because it says that no one seeks after God, no, not one. Is God unjust in destroying everyone? And does it make it even more unjust to say, I'm going to save a few? And few in biblical context could be, I don't know, a billion people, whatever it might be, right? Um, so let's get to this. All right, enough of the rambling. Man, Calvinism essentially teaches that Jesus didn't die for all the sins of the world that God is the author of sin, that God intentionally creates, predestines most people to spend eternally, eternity in hell, sorry, that man doesn't have to believe the gospel on his own to be saved, and that God does it for him, and that if a person was arbitrarily chosen, predetermined by God to be saved, the person's behavior, work, fruits, change life. All right, this is a run-on sentence. I wish he would put a period in there so I could take a breath. The point I'm trying to show you out of this is that he, what he says right here is that uh man doesn't have man doesn't have to believe the gospel on his own here's what i was looking for sorry to be saved god does it for him john 6 29 says that the work of god is that you believe on his son so let me tell you how people handle that scripture in in light of their free will decisionism to believe the gospel they say jesus was talking in tongue and cheek so there were people that were following him. I mean, they saw him do miracles with the bread. This is John 6. I think they were following him on a boat from Galilee. The bottom line is they were looking for him. He did these miracles. They wanted to see where he was at. Now, he knew some followed him because they saw the miracles. And others followed because they had faith. And that was the disciples. And so by the very end of the chapter, you see how when Jesus said, that's why I said unto you that no man can come to me unless it was given of my father. Because he's telling these people who are clearly after him because of his works. They're clearly after, after him for his miracles. Maybe there's some financial gain in that. Maybe some of them were, you know, interested in ruling a nation and having him, you know, feed armies with this ability to, to produce bread, right? Clearly, they weren't believers, right? It says they walked away and did not follow him anymore. To get the full context of this, I want you to understand that the reason why Jesus would say something like that is not so we could just use that scripture and constantly use it as a proof text for divine election, even though we could. But there's a deeper context to it. He's letting those people know that you can't just come to me unless it's given of my father. Now, what people like to do is they like to twist John 6 and say the ones who are given are the ones who believe. That's heresy. Okay. The verse clearly states in John 6, 37, all that my father gives to me will come to me. And he who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Okay, guys, you're given before you even come. To believe on Jesus Christ is to come to him. Well, you have to be given first. So for the people, they're going to say, well, yeah, see, those guys just wanted to believe on Jesus for his works, but Jesus wouldn't let that happen. He knew their unbelief. That doesn't change the fact that anyone who comes to Christ, for whatever reason you think it is on the surface, he's coming because Jesus says he was given to him by his father. It doesn't matter what the reason is. That's not even relevant anymore. In that context, he wanted to let those people know, hey, you can't come to me about this bread stuff. But he didn't say that. He didn't say, oh, you can't come to me because of my miracles. If your, your faith is vain. No. He said, no man. 
can come to me unless it is given of my father. So I want you to absorb that. It doesn't matter what earthly, fleshly reason you think someone might come into Christ that it's a vain faith. He's just literally making a declaration to all people. No man can come to me unless it's given to me, uh, unless he is given by my father. Uh, and so, no, John 6, 29 is not saying that you have to work the work of God by believing. It's he who began a good work in you. I don't know how many times I have to say that scripture before someone tries to refute it with their free will heresy. Making believing the most spiritual gift in the world, not the work of God, but the work of man. So you are saved by a work because they're taking John 6, 29 out of context. And they're saying that since the disciples asked, what must we do to work the works of God? Jesus didn't say, you must do this, believe. He knows that people who his father has given it to him will believe. That's why in John 6, 47, he says, he who believeth on me hath everlasting life. He doesn't say he who believeth on me will receive everlasting life. That's how we read it. I was guilty of that for years. No, no, it's those who believe have been given. You've been quickened, right? Let's take a look at a verse that proves that. I know I'm going to get to Ephesians. I'm sure you're like, he said he was going to do a teaching on Ephesians. This is so deep, guys. I, I'm not very good at this, putting together this stuff. I'm doing the best I can. I should probably make an itinerary. But every time I do that, I keep on redeciding what I'm going to put in there. So I try to just go with the flow. But look, guys, this is John 5. Um, I know I cut off the numbers of the verses. All right, so guys, believing the gospel and being quickened by the Spirit of God is com two completely different things. They're two different words. Quickened and believing are not the same thing. I'm not saying that we're quickened and then two years later we believe the gospel, but I did want you guys to also offer your own testimony. How long was it? I really would love to hear in the comment section that, uh, this question. How long was it from the moment that you knew that Jesus Christ was God, right? The moment that you knew that Jesus Christ was risen, right? The moment that you believe those two things, I believe that you were born of God in that moment. Now, did you believe that you had eternal security? I didn't. I'm going to tell you that right now. It took at least four years for me to believe I had eternal security, to believe that I was indeed saved salvation is being delivered and it's being literally delivered from your own conscience of sin and you could carry that even as even when you know you're saved you could still carry that right so it is tricky to know that moment that you i'm not trying to pinpoint the moment i was regenerated i do believe it was around the time that i believed that jesus was god and that he was risen because i don't think you can believe those things without the quickening of the spirit now, the quickening of the Spirit is not when you believe that Jesus died for all your sins. Those are different things. That's what saves you, meaning that, hey, Jesus died for my sins. I'm saved. That's deliverance from your condemnation, that eternal judgment is upon you. That is what salvation is. It's deliverance. It's different from being quickened. All right, so everyone who's quickened will believe. I'm not saying the two are divorced from one another. They're completely linked. The fact that you believe that is because you've been quickened. You can't just drum up the fact that Jesus is God on your own, man. Come on. Who wants, to, who wants to say that? Who wants to make the claim that they believe that Jesus is God simply because they believe facts in the Bible that they read about him? You don't want to give the credit to the Holy Spirit for that? Because that's what's going to save you. Understanding the deity of Jesus Christ and that he is risen, that fact alone can only be known from the Holy Spirit telling you that, okay? No one could say that Jesus is the cursed and no one could say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Spirit, okay? So John 5, 21 is gonna show us that this is God's decision. Remember, John 6, he's telling them the next chapter, no man can come to me unless it is given of my Father in heaven, okay? No matter what you think about coming to me, it ain't happening unless it's given of my Father. And so we can either accept that or not. See, that, that's a decision you can make. You can, you can make the decision to believe that Jesus Christ 
he will quicken whom he will. It says it right there in John 5, 21. You can use your free will to accept or reject this truth. I'm not saying your salvation hinges upon it. That's what they say. They say that you have to believe that you made the decision. Otherwise, you can't have eternal security. That's what they say. So, and I'm going to show you in another post that they're saying that you have to believe that you made the decision to believe the gospel. Otherwise, you're not saved. That's totally insane. I know I said I would discuss this later in the video, but there was something I wanted to add about this comment. This is, this is your, you know, the most loving Christian woman there is. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> let's just, let's just show. All right. So it says their false gospel cannot save. It saves no one. When, when this person says there, she's talking about us, people that believe that God predestined us before the foundation of the world, even though that's exactly what the scripture says. That's who she's talking about. Anybody who believes that. Not just Calvinists, like stars of Calvinism, like uh, John MacArthur, John Piper. And honestly, I don't even know how their beliefs really line up with the doctrine of predestination. They, they add this progressive sanctification in there. And, you know, it's just bizarre. But anyway, um, the heresy that they teach is that man cannot believe the gospel. So they must be born again first. Uh, that's true. Yeah, that's true. I'm about to demonstrate that, but let's move on. So they must be born again first, because here's the problem. Everyone thinks that being born again is being saved, okay? I'm going to demonstrate through the scriptures that born again is being made alive, okay? Nowhere in the scripture does it say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be born again. Show me that scripture. They're confusing it with Christ's conversation with Nicodemus when he says a man must be born again. He's simply stating a fact to Nicodemus. And then later in the chapter, he'll say, he who believeth on me has eternal life. Well, the person who believes is already possessing eternal life. Their spirit has already been quickened. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna demonstrate that. So they must be born again first. And then believing the gospel is a fruit of the spirit after they are born again. So how are they justified, born again, and indwelled with the Holy Spirit of promise? Well, according to these false teachers, God just ju just regenerates them out of nowhere with no believing required on their part. There's no persuasion needed, no faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God. None of the gospel being power of God unto salvation, just magic zap and you're saved now, Juan. So here you have a person who is mocking the power of God, literally mocking it. Yes, faith comes by hearing. That means you're given a gift of faith. When you hear the faith, the fact that you are regenerated what is what makes you believe. You're, you don't have the capability of believing without the Holy Spirit. I just showed you the verse, 1 Corinthians 12, 3. No one can say that Jesus Christ is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. How can you profess that Jesus is Lord without the Holy Ghost? Okay, whoever confesses with the mouth the Lord Jesus and believe that God raised him from the dead shall be saved. So you're making a confession to salvation, but you've already been regenerated. Okay. I'm not saying, like I said, I'm not saying this takes place years before you're able to confess that Jesus is Lord. I'm not saying that, but it's by the Holy Ghost that you can do that. So that means the Holy Ghost preceded you being able to make a confession unto salvation. So that's, that stops her dead in her tracks right there. The other verses I'm about to get into will too. But so, so yeah, so Christ regenerating your dead spirit is called zap. You're saved now. A zap you're saved now, Wand. That's what she's calling the quickening work. Like it says right there in the verse I was on, John 5, 21, he will quicken who he will. Well, quickening doesn't mean save. They're not synonyms. And especially in a biblical term. Uh, okay, how do these evil workers attempt to steal your assurance? Well, if we are not justified by believing the gospel, then you cannot be certain that you are saved. Simple as that. I don't want to get into the rest because she's teaching progressive sanctification that, you know, all these Calvinists do that. Well, make no mistake about it. These people, they think we're Calvinists, okay? We've never preached progressive sanctification. So the rest of this diatribe here is pointless to go into. But right there, there you have it. See, 
if we are not justified by believing the gospel, then you cannot be certain you're saved. Everyone who is justified believes the gospel. Okay? It says in Romans 3.24, being justified freely by his grace. Is there an act of believing done there? Romans 8.30 says those he called, he also justified. Where's man's operation there? See, the fact that you're justified, you're a believer. Okay? They're trying to tell you that you have to believe that it was your decision to believe. The fact that you are persuaded to believe these things is because the light of the glorious gospel has been shined upon you. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, I think, or 4.5, around there. So you believe these things because your spirit has been quickened, as I'm going to demonstrate. So being justified freely by his grace, where is your action in there? Romans 3.24. Check it out yourself. Being justified freely by his grace. That means you did nothing to get that. Remember, guys, you were reconciled at the cross, Romans 5.10. While you were an enemy of God, he hath reconciled you by his death. When was his death? Okay? And so, yeah, I submit that it could be bang, bang. The second you're quickened, you believe the gospel. Because faith does come by hearing, right? So you hear and believe. But why is it that you believe and another person has no ears to hear? Because they weren't given the gift of faith. Their spirit wasn't regenerated. They weren't born of God. Remember, John 8, 43, he who heareth my word is born of God. So how can you hear anything of God if you're not of God, meaning quickened? He who heareth my word is of God. You do not hear my word because you are not of God, he says to the Pharisees, John 8, 43. So the one who hears the word is already of God. That's what Jesus is saying. That is ridiculous. They're telling you that you have an accursed gospel if Christ was the one who did the work in you to cause your belief. That's an accursed gospel. Can you believe that? That's mind-blowing stuff right there. So 521, John 521. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. Why does he say whom he will? Most free will advocates are right away going to import this. The whom he will are the ones who believe. Guys, we already know that's not the case. That is clearly not the case. Jesus told the Pharisees that you believe not because you are not of my sheep. He didn't say you're not of my sheep because you do not believe. Please understand, this is very simple stuff. I'm not trying to cause a great commotion over this. This actually is really simple. Once you take away the bias of free will and you kind of just look at this stuff objectively, if you're a believer, the Holy Spirit's going to show you. I'm confident in that. And I'm not saying it's going to show everybody on the same time scale. You know, the people that were going against with this stuff on YouTube may believe this stuff in five years from now. Who knows? I'm not, I'm not saying they're out for the count on believing this. They're railing hard against it now. But So why is Jesus saying that? For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them. Okay. Remember Lazarus? Jesus called Lazarus. Remember Jesus called Lazarus. He called him and said, rise. Did Lazarus make a decision to rise? Come on. Be honest with yourselves. That's all I ask. Uh, even so, the Son quickeneth whom he will. Whom he will. Well, the whom he will is all that the Father has given to him. You don't have to go too far. The scriptures, you can't divorce them. You can't make exceptions and say, well, that would be a Calvinist God. No, that's your God right there in John 5, 21, saying he's going to quicken who he will. Okay, that implies that this decision is on part of God. Okay, now let's get to the quickening. Without any further ado, let's get to Ephesians. Okay, so here's the verse in question. We all love it. An amazing truth. Just a little bit taken out of context to argue against God's sovereign grace. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom 
also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Remember, Paul is writing to the saints at Ephesus. They're believers. It's my, it's my contention that this is not the book of Ephesians, the, all of it, all six chapters, I believe it is, is not the milk of the word. You can differ with me on that. That's perfectly fine. I just want to make that contention. This is not the milk of the word. But he is reminding them of this because you know what? No matter how good you are at learning the scriptures and studying them, do you not need to be reminded of that beautiful truth every day? Because I got to tell you, I, I, I need it. I need that truth. I need to understand it every day. And that's something that I got to commit myself to doing. It's an actual work. It's something that Paul asks us to renew our mind. It's not going to renew itself. If you just keep on, you know, just getting away from the faith and not accepting this truth and you're constantly under the law, constantly under condemnation, you can't recognize this truth. It's going to keep bringing you down. It'll shipwreck your faith. So let's take a look at this word because this is the point of contention right here from a lot of people. Uh, ye were sealed with. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar. I think I preface by saying we don't really need the Greek. But let's just get the blue letter Bible definition of this word seal. It actually doesn't have the word. It has the phrase, the entire phrase, ye were sealed with, okay? And so right here, I'll post it on screen. To set a seal upon, mark with a seal to seal for security from Satan. Since things sealed up are concealed as the contents of a letter to hide, that's not the right definition. In order to mark a person or a thing, that's consistent because God has marked us. He has marked us with the seal of the Holy Spirit so he knows who his are. I mean, he knew us before the foundation of the world. But what I'm saying is that this is how we know that he has marked us. He has sealed us. In other words, we can't lose our salvation. That's really what the verse is saying. Angels are also said to be sealed by God. Okay? The other definitions to confirm, authenticate, place beyond doubt. All those really could be applicable to this. It's without a doubt that we're saved until the day of redemption, sealed with this Holy Spirit until the day of redemption, which is saved eternally. Um, and so I don't doubt any of this stuff. But this has nothing to do with what we're going to get into here. The very next chapter. Uh, and let me show you why this is relevant, actually. So, And so this person starts off according to Calvinists. I think they should, to be totally honest, also put a slash there and say sovereign gracers. Because I'm not a Calvinist. I don't believe in progressive sanctification and fruit inspecting. I know no man after the flesh. I myself don't live a perfectly clean lifestyle. The furthest thing from it. Okay? Let me just tell you that right now. I would never judge a person by their fruits. Uh, I know that the works that a person who is born again of God has is being done in them by God. It's not of their own will. God is working in them to do his will. Okay, and so it says here, according to Calvinists, justification is not by faith, so it's not trusting in Jesus. Okay, I've never said that in my entire life. Not believing the gospel according to the scriptures that saves you. Believing God to them is a work of righteousness. I think I actually just demonstrated how they believe it's a work of righteousness. This person's good friend says that believing the gospel is a moral, ethical decision. A work of righteousness would be that. And boasting that we cannot do. So I'm boasting that I can't believe. Yes, no one seeks after God. No, not one. There is none righteous. No, not one. I am not outside of that group. I suppose they think they are. Because according to them, they seek after God when no one in the world did. Right? So how am I the one boasting when I'm including myself in the wretched, wicked bunch of sinners that don't seek after God? Um. There is none of his faith was counted unto him as righteousness. Right, so what she's trying to say is that it was his faith. Well, I mean, this is really simple. Just go to Romans 3. Uh, right here, Romans 3. Being justified freely by his grace. How are we justified? How are we saved? By grace. The mechanism through faith 
They're not divorced either. Everyone who is saved by grace has faith. That's, that can't be separated. Now, they want to say that the faith is not the gift. Big problem. We have videos on that. I will leave a link in the description of at least two or three videos. I think I have a, a video entitled, Faith is Not Corporate. Okay? Faith is a gift of God. Okay? It was given to the saints. So I, I suppose you can say that it's corporate in that sense. But what I mean by corporate is it's not given to every person in the world. You see, these people have, they have um, conflicting views. Be still a no and Greg have conflicting views. Greg thinks Romans 12, 3 is saying that every person ever born was given a mustard seed of faith. Colleen knows that can't be true because Christ is the author and finisher of our faith. So he would be finishing everyone's faith. That's how you see that. He tried to say, no, this is just showing that faith is given to us in a measure so that some may prophesy, some may edify, some may teach, things like that. Well, it doesn't say that either. It doesn't say that either. It's just saying that everyone is dealt a measure of faith. And then it does say that through that faith, they will do X, Y, and Z. That's fine. They were still dealt that faith, right? Uh, to, to say that she had to, she had to, this is where the heresy comes in. He had to actually say that that was an initial saving faith, which is ours. So that part is our faith. And once we activate this quote unquote initial saving faith, then Christ gives us his faith. This is all made up. It's not there in the scripture. Look at the rest of the verses in Romans 3. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. By faith of Jesus Christ. And yes, you do not believe to receive faith. That is utterly ridiculous. Believing and having faith are the same thing. Romans 4, 5. But to him who worketh not, but believeth on the one who justify the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So what you'd have to say here is that we activate the faith of God by doing something that no one else could do so here's what's interesting about these passages is we know that we were justified freely by his grace what does that mean it means that we did absolutely nothing to be justified that's what that verse means okay it's not divorced from faith everyone who is justified has faith in jesus christ he quickens our spirit freely by his grace. That is how it's done. Now, all those that believe just simply means that everyone who has been justified is a believer. We believe on the one who justifies the ungodly. He justified us when we were ungodly. He didn't justify us because we did something like believing. Think about the verse. But to him who worketh not, what is the work of God that you believe on the Son? It's his work, right? So how does that fly with to him that worketh not? See, faith is not a work of us. It's a work of God. The fact that we believe is the work of God, he who began a good work in you, right? So try to stay with me here. I know it's, it can get a little convoluted, but the verse says, Romans 4, 5. But to him who worketh not, but believeth on the one who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Why is it our faith? Because it's a gift. Believing and having faith are the same thing. He who believeth on me hath eternal life. Okay? Now, to give a more in-depth look at this, as to why the scripture shows that we don't believe and then receive another kind of faith. There's no other kind of faith. It's the faith of Jesus Christ, but it's been gifted to us. So now it's ours. 
That's why you can read Romans 4, 5 freely without any confusion. His faith is counted for righteousness. What faith? The initial saving faith or the, felt, the faith that's of Jesus Christ? It's one faith, guys. One faith, one baptism, one Lord and our Lord Jesus Christ. One God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Sorry. Um, now. Let's go to Ephesians to prove this point unequivocally and just take it home. And hopefully I went in a good order here. So we're going to move over to chapter 2. Okay? Now, look at this verse. Okay? And it's a short sentence, but take it in slowly. And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Guys, is the person who is dead in trespasses and sins a believer? No. These people don't believe that. This is why it's very easy to look at this heresy. You could do it yourself. You don't need any special understanding. You don't need a Greek concordance. Guys, what I have highlighted right there is a person who is not a believer. Well, what happened before that? What does that word mean? I'm going to do a little bit of work for you. If you don't want to, you know, a lot of people, they don't like to get to the Greek, and I'm one of them because I'm not a Greek scholar. But every now and then they do it, and they try to say, look, we went to the Greek. They're preaching heresy. Just to be thorough, it's really all I want to be is just thorough with the word here. So we're in Ephesians 2, and let's check out what the word quickened means. Actually, let's go to verse 5 because that's even more plain to see. Let's go to verse 5. And I'll go to verse 5 in the Greek concordance. Let's see here. Hath he quickened us together with? Okay. I'm pretty sure you already know, but I'll, I want to be thorough. And I'll, I'll post this up when I edit it. This is Ephesians 2.5. Even when ye, or we, sorry, were dead in sins, guys, you're not saved here, okay? You're not a believer. You haven't believed yet. You're dead in your sins, okay? So what happens next? Hath quickened us. What that says here is to make one alive. To make one alive together with Christ. You're made spiritually alive before you believe the gospel, guys. I, sorry I took so long to get to it, but there's a lot of other stuff that needs to be hashed out. So, you know, for whatever this is worth, I really would like people. I'm trying to win. <laughs> See, I keep saying me. This is not about me. But the purpose of the videos that I'm doing is that people who believe that they did something for God to quicken their spirit, I want you to see that all you have to do is open your Bible and go to Ephesians chapter 2, and you can see with your own two eyes. Try to take that, that hard free will stance that you have and just momentarily divorce yourself from it, if you can do that. Just look at the other side of things is all I ask. You know, when I first learned this stuff a little over a year ago, I was taken aback by it myself. And through a few weeks of cognitive dissonance, I came out of the fog. And I believe that God's word is true and that every man is a liar. And if someone is telling you that you can go from being a sheep to a goat or vice versa, they're either being willfully ignorant to support a theology they like or they don't believe God's word, you know. I think it's most cases they're being willf willfully ignorant to support a presuppositional stance that they're holding on to very hardly. I mean, they're holding on to it like grim death. Pardon the pun, but... So, there you have it. You're quickened before you're a believer, guys. The seal is something that is done after you believe. Okay, Paul made that very clear in Ephesians 1. So why is he saying when that you were dead in sins hath quickened us together with Christ? That was the moment that you were born of God. 
And look, we'll take a look at some other verses that make this even more abundantly clear. This is John 10, 26. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them to me, is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Guys, did you see what Jesus said there? John 10, 29. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all. Guys, if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, you were given by the Father to the Son. And the Son quickened you. The Son quickeneth who he will. Other translations say the Son quickeneth who he wishes. And then you see in John 3, 5, I think it is, where he talks about, we don't know where the Spirit comes from, nor where it goes. It goes where it wishes. The Son will quickeneth whom he will. You're quickened by the Spirit of God. You're not quickened by anything that you do. Jesus came to seek and save what is lost. You didn't seek and save yourself by doing something. The reason why you're a believer is because Christ quickened your spirit and made you spiritually alive to understand something like the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation. It's not an ethical, moral decision that you make. You don't sit there with a pen and paper and make two columns, pros and cons of believing or not. Sorry. People who say that totally and utterly desecrate the word of God, and they should be ashamed of themselves. That I do believe. I might be out of pocket for saying that, but I think they should be absolutely ashamed of themselves for saying such heresy that believing the gospel is a moral decision that you make that makes it a work, first of all. I don't know how they can't see that. All right, sorry. Getting a little uppity again. Let me go back here to John chapter 8. John chapter 8 and 40. Where am I? Uh... So he's saying here to Pharisees, why do ye not understand my speech? Rhetorical question. Even because ye cannot hear my word. What did he say about the sheep? <laughs> he said they hear his voice. Guys, how do you hear the gospel and believe it? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. If you cannot hear his speech, you cannot hear the gospel. You cannot hear the faith. I am not saying that your spirit is quickened and then you believe the gospel 10 years later. Okay? I'm just making that correlation in the beginning of the video how, how many of us believe that Jesus was God and he was risen from the dead, but it took a while to understand that you had eternal security. I think most of us can make that same claim. Am I wrong for pointing that out? You know, so maybe the spirit does quicken us and it takes longer than we think to truly believe the gospel. And I mean, believe it, like believe that you're saved. I think it's my, it's my contention that your spirit's quickened and you believe the gospel, but you don't fully understand the gift of it. And you need to be ministered to, to understand that God gives you more and more increase. And you understand that you are saved and you have confidence. Having that confidence takes years. So let me at least make that contention that it takes years to have that confidence in many cases, in some cases, maybe decades, right? The moment you believe the gospel, you may not have that confidence. So let me just say that. Uh, but yeah, the quickening of the spirit absolutely precedes the fact that you believe the gospel. That's pretty abundantly clear now. Um, uh, faith is a gift, guys. I mean, 100%. There's no initial saving faith, and then it's Christ's faith that was gifted to you. There's none of that in the scripture. It's always been Christ's faith always and it was gifted to you the believer uh and uh let me demonstrate that too in ephesians chapter 2 something i had a slight revelation of today all right so let's take a look at this passage we've looked at it a lot for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of god so let's look at the gifts okay to anyone who disagrees with me is grace a gift? Well, let me say that again. To anyone who disagrees with me that faith is a gift, is grace a gift? Is grace given to us? Do we now have grace? What did Paul say in Romans 12, 3? 
by the grace given to me, I say to each and every one of you, not to think highly of themselves. Paul knew he was given grace. Okay? So we were given grace, right? We didn't give it to ourselves. We all agree, right? I got my hands up in the air right now. We all agree, right? Okay. Now, are ye saved? Well, guys, we know that salvation is a gift. But the verb saved is not the noun salvation. That's an action. It is by grace ye are saved. Okay? So, not saying, I'm not saying salvation is not a gift, but it's all part and parcel. It's the same thing. This whole thing right here is a gift. <laughs> this is all a gift. You're given grace. You're given salvation. You're given faith. It is not of yourselves. Is Paul saying that the verb saved is not of yourself? He's saying the faith is not of yourself. The grace is not of yourself. Okay, we all know that salvation is of God. I'm pretty sure the saints at Ephesus knew that much. For by grace you are saved through faith and that not of yourself. What is not of yourself here? We clearly know that the, the fact that we're saved is not of ourselves. We can't, no one can save themselves. I mean, I don't even think Pelagian thought that. Pelagius. I don't even think Pelagius thought that. And he's the most hardcore free willer you're going to find. But how could you think that it's uh, uh, any of these things are of yourself? That's my contention is, you know, this is a verb right here. Faith is a noun and grace is a noun. But saved is a verb. Okay? And that is not of yourself. We know it's the we know the grace is not of ourselves. We know that salvation is not of ourselves. Faith is also not of ourselves. Faith is the gift of God. Why do you think you have faith in Christ when so many don't? Because he gave you a gift. I hope this edifies someone, guys. Take care. God bless you. Talk to you soon.